So hello and welcome to another episode of The Way to Be Interviews. I'm Frederick Dunn, and today my special guest is Cayman Reynolds. Cayman keeps hundreds of beehives in the state of Tennessee, right here in the United States. When Cayman isn't working with bees, he can often be found giving educational talks and bee-related presentations all over the United States. Please check the video description for more links and updates. Here's Cayman. So I'm Cayman Reynolds. I'm from Tennessee. I do bee stuff. Wow. Yeah. That was a really good. <laughs> was that the whole entry? Is that your, you do yes. bee stuff and you're in Tennessee? So what what we're like doing that. is we're, we're working on a blooper reel for you. What, that's what we're doing. Fred. No, this is real. We've started. I'm not going back. This is it. That's the real Cayman Reynolds. And I thank you so much, Cayman, for agreeing to finally interview with me because I've been chasing you down for at least two years, by the way. I'm a fast runner. Right. You're a fast runner and you're you're just busy. You're always you're always on YouTube. I wonder how you have time to do the bees. So most of us know who you are. So hopefully people that are watching will find out some new things tonight because we're gonna we're gonna dig deep on Cayman Reynolds because there's stuff I want to know. And I just figured I would invite everybody else along to watch and learn right along with me. So one of the things that people get into right away when they're talking to uh people that they're interviewing. You always go back to the roots and stuff, but you said something in one of your videos. I think you said that your wife, Laurel, before you were married, had bees. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So she's actually the senior beekeeper, yet she's always on the other mm. side of the camera. Oh, don't waffle. No, you did not. Update. <laughs> she was, okay, why, like. why was she keeping bees? And what did you notice first about uh, your future wife at the time when you found out she kept bees? What were your thoughts? Well, I figured she was a keeper at that point. And you know, a one beekeeper, of the other a beekeeper. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. Good, one. Good pun. Uh, All right. Yes, I had to go there. So it, no, Laurel actually is not the senior beekeeper. I was keeping bees at 14. She started around 18. And but she was already into all kinds of things in agriculture and then also blacksmithing. If it was outdoorsy, you know. Uh, she helped re rehabilitate some animals that, you know, their mothers were hit on a highway or something. So she's quite a outdoorsy person and, and very well read. Uh, whenever she speaks, it's very intelligent, but she is pretty darn shy and, and really does not want to be on the camera. So she had forced me to do YouTube because she said it was a good idea. And here mm -hmm. we are. So what's your opinion now? Is she right? What do you think, Fred? Um, I think I'm eating... she was right. I'm, we're talking right now. I mean, I know about you. You've had an influence on my life. I would say that that was a very good decision on her part to get behind the camera, take care of the technical stuff, which you apparently have no ability to do. And <laughs> yeah, I think uh, let's backtrack, though. You said she was doing blacksmithing. She's, mm -hmm. a, oh, she's yeah. a metal worker. Like oh, yeah, she... and blowtorch and you know, hammering things out or shoeing oh, yeah. horses? What, what was she doing? So all kinds of stuff, uh, primarily in Sevierville, where uh, we've, we've been in the past, there's several places there where it's, it's very touristy and they want those fancy gates and shelves and stuff. And so she would, you know, help forge, you know, decorative gates and shelves and different things, hearth pieces, all that stuff. Wow. So wrought Tri iron gates. Triangles. You know, ding, 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 they call you know, people for stuff. dinner. Do yeah. Um, no, it's come and get it around here. And I just hope I beat Jimmy to the table. Jimmy but, is your seven year old for those who are wondering. Go ahead. Yeah. Mr. <laughs> Banana Eye. <laughs> and Laurel, when it comes to uh, the rest of the stuff, uh, she's very technical. And like the, my extraction line has three pieces that need 220. And I really don't know much about wiring, but Laurel is really good with that. So I can bring a lot to the table. It takes a very steady hand to hold a flashlight just so. And I'd like to say that I'm up there in the top tier of flashlight holders. That's the, and now where did she learn all of that? Just like she's just quick on the learn. She looks at things, picks it up, grabs a book. What does she do? Yeah. Like, um, wiring she, schematics and things like that she likes to read she likes to know how things work and her dad was into construction and and did a couple of those things and she her dad needed a 
someone to help out with the family business. And so Laura was the the, the person. He had some sons, but they were several years later and, and Laura wanted to be outdoors doing those hmm. physical jobs. So when we put the roof on our house, she was the one doing all the hard angle cuts um, and compound, saying how- compound miter saw cuts and stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I could do the cuts and the hauling, but, you know, there was a lot of math and getting everything just so. And, you know, she's the one that did that. So Laurel's um, my secret weapon. You know, a lot of people think that I've got all these amazing skills to get this stuff done. But really, I just run my mouth and keep bees. And outside of that, I just say yes, dear. I like that. I like it. So you've been keeping them since you were 14. So does that mean... Let's talk about Natalie, beekeeping with Natalie. Is she she started at eight or nine or something? Yeah, I think it was nine, but maybe it was eight. It's it's hard to remember, but it seems like she's been around a long time and she's only 15, which is wild. Yeah. So she's basically the age now where you started. Oh yeah, but way ahead. She's doing stuff That's... that I already that I was doing at like 23 and 24. Right. Why do you think that is? Why are you? Is that because she has access to all this information of people that you might not have had when you were her age? I mean, you probably didn't have the internet yet, right? Yeah, not Al Gore had barely invented it at that point. Um, Al Gore invented the internet and Love Story, the movie, was about he and Tipper. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I'd forgotten yeah. so many things. So Dear the people. internet w wasn't around much at that yeah. point. And so I had a lot of books, but the problem was, is it was around 2007, 2006, um, 2008. I can't remember the exact year I started, but that was when CCD really went down and everyone was trying to find something to blame for why bees were um, just disappearing. Yeah. Yeah. And around that time, technology started coming into play and a lot of the information really dominating in this region mm. was don't treat your bees, don't feed your bees, you know, let nature figure this out and mm -hmm. no nature will figure it out. All right. And so uh, my earliest years in beekeeping, I was losing my shirt year after year trying to do that. And eventually I learned that actually taking care of them like a chicken or a cow resulted in very uh, good results. But Natalie's already got that going and she, her dad and mom are, are super awesome as well. So right. Um, yeah, um, and you know, girls seem to be a little bit more on the quicker on the uptake, at least in my experience. Okay. Yeah. And, and is Annette girls listening to this quicker on the uptake? Okay. All right. So, well, that's actually, that's, but it's so true that we have access to information. Now things are so immediate. Plus we can get responses from people that are area experts or people that are keeping the bees the way we hope to. And you can get feedback from them almost right away, thanks to social media like Facebook. And now we have YouTube mm -hmm. and uh, these groups, these social groups, live streams, live chats. None of that was going on, right? So mm -hmm. I used to watch DVDs. You and I, basically, I started in 2006. You started in 2007. So we've got the same number of years kind of uh, behind us. Mm -hmm. And I was never trying to get into that and earn a living from it, which is a huge stressor in my book. And you yeah. mentioned uh, chickens and cattle. So I know you've kept chickens. Did you also raise beef? You know, not a lot. Just for a handful of years, we had some red poles, and I really missed those cows. They were they were a great breed of cows, P-O-L-L. -L. Uh, they had a really good milk. They were good mothers. Uh, if you crossed them with an Angus, you would get a really nice calf. Um, the problem was we had too many irons in the fire going, and something had to to disappear, and Mm -hmm. So bees, bees ended up dominating for me. And a lot of that was going on when myself and, and my two brothers were still living with my parents. And so we were able to do a lot more once pretty much within a span of a couple of years, all of us um, flew the coop, got kicked out of the coop. It depends on the uh, situation. Kicked out of the coop. Did you wait to be kicked out or did you find a path and leave home with your knapsack on the end of a pole? Oh, uh, no, I, I didn't get kicked out, but, um, you know, I, I just remember my dad as a teenager, like, you know, there's X amount of time and you know, eventually, you know, you know, I've already dealt with this for so many years. It's, you know, it's, it's time for you to fly, whether your wings are fully feathered or not. I, I think it's a good thing. I think it's uh, a good thing too. So did you have to then go out and live on your own for a while? Like, 
bachelor like living in a tiny apartment or the back room of the gas station or how did it go no no um basically i, I married laurel um at, at, around that time so went so, straight from home to a new home exactly which my mother um, said at our wedding um reception afterwards of all of her sons she was really most concerned about me uh, actually living as a bachelor she didn't think i'd actually be able to take care of myself and <laughs> my my wife agrees wholeheartedly um i'm really good at uh, certain things but little details uh, when like feeding yourself and and drinking water i i forget sometimes so you're kind of like a bee you don't survive alone you need that social structure and you need all that uh, division God. of labor and everything i i gotta have i gotta have the queen okay so let's talk about some other stuff um do you still raise chickens you were doing that for meat right for a while yes yes we did were quite you, a bit of that were you doing and those cornish crosses or what were you running i was doing cornish cross and you know it was a very similar to the chicken experience early on i was making a lot of mistakes and instead of eventually going you know what these cornish cross are so hybridized or gmo uh, which i don't, I don't think they're mm -hmm. gmo at all um that uh, it's you know it's an evil bird and and what i found is that they just needed nutrition at a very accelerated rate because right. they're growing at an accelerated rate right. and so i mean if it takes a laying hen six months to get to size she's got she can spread that nutrition over six months and she has a lot more opportunity to eat bugs and different things mm -hmm. but but that a uh, bird growing and being processed in eight to nine weeks right it's got to have essentially the same amount of volume as that laying hen in six to eight months mm-hmm and actually, so, they gave that down to six weeks, five to six weeks is what you're getting at Colonel Sanders, by the way. That's crazy. You know, we, but we like to jumbo birds. And so did the uh, the families that we sold to, because um, once they get to a certain size, they make better broth. And usually around eight to nine weeks, so I always thought that was a really sweet spot. We'd end up with an average of four and a half pounds dressed weight with the bigger ones, like the cockerels being around five. 5.4 yeah. and now, if you tried to keep them longer than that did you find out they had troubles walking and stuff they would just sit down and like their bones weren't keeping up or were they still early good? early on we had those problems to, um the last several years when we were doing thousands a year um no we didn't have a problem we could run them 12 weeks without any issues and those, so those you, were... you lean out their rations to get them that long or like what did you do um no we let them eat whatever they wanted oh really um, that's interesting yes so we used to do that where we would um, lean out their rations, but we eventually got a custom mix and we would add probiotics with riboflavin and several B vitamins. And that's the main problem with the legs is the riboflavin is in, in too short a supply, especially for how fast they grow. And also uh, we added kelp, which has, I believe, 56 trace minerals in it. And since we were getting this freshly ground from a, a company in Lebanon, Tennessee called Edwards, I mean, this stuff, you open the bag and it smells good. It's mm -hmm. not pelletized. It's ground that day. And we had that mixed custom. We also would put in their phosphate, um, collodial phosphate, which helped out quite a bit um, with bone development. Collodial phosphate is wonderful for bones and teeth. So you know, we would put this ration in there and we would get birds that would weigh seven to eight pounds if we'd run them to 11 to 12 weeks and they would be wonderfully healthy hmm. but but it, there's not a chance that you could do that off of just a generic broiler feed it, it, we right. never could get that to work so right um but that, so i missed did you that. work that out I'm sorry for interrupting did you work that out through a local like food co-op where they did you talk to some mix master and they put all these things together for you and you got your how did you come up with that poultry diet? Where did you learn about it? A lot of it was um, Joel Salatin. Um, okay, he I know seven... who that is. Yeah, Mother Earth News. Oh, yeah, Joel, um, he, he's he's cool. Um, I got an interesting story on Joel, if you'll give me a chance to share it. Absolutely. So nothing derogatory towards Joel at all. I was um, 17 at the time, and I was going with a buddy of mine to a conference, and Joel was the keynote speaker, and, and Joel's one of those guys that even if you're really not an outdoorsy person, you're going to want to start farming after you read his material or listen to his books. And I was already interested. So afterwards, I got to, to meet Joel for a second with my friend, and he asked what we wanted to do. 
And I said, well, one day I want to be able to, you know, do chickens and honeybees um, for a living. But I also want to be an educator like you because I think you do some awesome stuff. And he laughed really hard and said, oh, you want to be famous, do you? And I, I don't think he took me fully seriously, but I really meant it. <laughs> and uh, yeah. but I, I kind of get it because a lot of time you, you probably hear that and I, I really just thought that Joel and I still think that Joel has made a huge impact on on the community, especially in the free range meat area. But right. yeah, Joel has all kinds of information on that and we did tweak it. And since we were buying tons and tons at a time, they were okay with mixing whatever we wanted to right. into that. Yeah. Yeah. So if, you're meeting, if you're meeting that large volume, then you can get that mix for yourself. And then so how long would that feed last? Like, did you buy it six months in advance? Did you stockpile a year? Oh, no. This stuff would start molding. And especially in the humid right. Tennessee, um, you have about, if it's stored outside in a bin, which is where I stored mine, um, it was good for about 30 days. Hmm. Wow. Um, so you're going you know, but, but yeah, it, it, it never lasted that long. It, um, we usually wouldn't have it more than two weeks, and then we'd go to get another load. Mm-hmm. And they didn't put any preservatives in it or anything like that. And the guys at Edwards, you know, they it's a multi generational business, and they understood a lot about nutrition as well. Um, they're still there. I, I absolutely love that business. The only thing I don't like about them is they're an hour and a half from the house. Yeah. Do you have any chickens now? Not, not that aren't in the freezer currently. Um, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask you if, if you felt they had any impact on small high beetles and things like that. They, uh, I think they do. I so really do. People that have these free ranging flocks that are super productive, uh, that may have a lot to do with the lack of even wax moths because they fly around at, you know, 10 inches off the ground mm-hmm. often and chickens will run 50 yards to get a moth on grass. So yeah, they, they love it. The small hive beetles, I think they well, when we've kept chickens uh, around beehives, they will wake up. You know, you'll open the door in the, in the early morning. The first thing they do is head out and run around for a second, and then they almost always go underneath the bee stands. Sure. And and the they'll forest, do it late of an yeah. evening too, and they'll just yeah. scratch underneath. And whenever we have any small hive beetle problems, we'll I'll chuck a frame that's just full of them in there, and you would think it was. You know, Christmas morning, those chickens sure. absolutely love it. So then why'd you get rid of them? Seems like you would still have some. You know, this, we have, you know, this conference thing and it's kind too much of work. Uh, too much too work. Much work, you know, too much work. these kids got to get a little bit older. You know, Jimmy's seven. He's good at eating things. He's not so good about you know feeding things. So yeah. we got to work on that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I would not trust my grandson to take care of my chickens, but I think my chickens foraging because... They debug acres and mm-hmm. uh, they're constant. Like I've never seen a tick until this spring. Like we never had a tick on anybody, but the kids were in the woods and one of them showed up with a tick on his leg. So I was thinking about that. Our chickens are controlling every bug that's 14 inches or closer to the ground. They make a difference. Big difference. Very interesting. And I don't have any small high beetles. Like I can't do any beetle buster trap tests. I can't you know, see if anything works. I can't do the peppermint challenge. I can't do anything because I don't have, now I'm not asking for small high beetles. Yeah. What a problem. But I can't, right. My only issue is of course, Varroa and Nozema and stuff like that. Sure. Those are the things I pay attention to. So now we'll move on to bees. And uh, I do want to ask you something about your test yard. You mentioned a test yard maybe a year ago or so. And yeah. I thought yeah. you received a bunch of Apame hives that were going to be in a test yard. Is that yeah. true? I did. I did. I have 26 of them. So let's fill us in on that. How did it go start to finish? And what do you like or not like? Or what's the future like for the Apame hives at the Reynolds apiary? Oh, I really like them. Um, I, you know, the, the biggest thing with, with a hive like that is the cost. And that's one of the first things people balk at. However, uh, I find it interesting um, from a hobbyist point of view that, you know, people are often willing to pay a lot of money for um, feed supplements that may or may not be helpful. Uh, they're willing to buy a flow hive. They're willing to do all these things, but you know, an, an Apame hive is, is extremely durable. And what I like about it 
is it's made with U.S. plastic. And it's like Texas plastic. They send it over to Turkey. They're made over there and then shipped back over. So it's food grade, USA plastic. I like that. They're very durable. Um, some of the insulated hives out there aren't as tough as these. Mm-hmm. These things, you break your foot, you know, try to kick the thing. And mm-hmm. I'll, the pollen trap's my favorite part. So as far as a functionality, I can't think of any reason why somebody wouldn't enjoy to use one. Oh, um, I feel so stupid all of a sudden. Okay. The only the only thing that uh, from a commercial standpoint is you want to be able, whenever you move hives, you like to be able to move two or four or six sure. at a time. Mm-hmm. But I think for your side liner, um, and there's professional beekeepers that actually do use them, especially in other countries. I, I think there's some merits to explore. You know, when it comes to new stuff, try one or two out. See mm-hmm. how you like it. Um, don't be like me. I used to go and buy 200 of one item, and then two years later, they're in a pile somewhere. Mm-hmm. So, because, for example, what's going on right now, we have this heavy storm, heavy weather. If an Apame hive rolled across a field, everything would be in it, in order, intact. They they hook together. Uh, but the way I feel so dumb is because I just got asked to participate in this pollen study. <clears throat> so I'm thinking about putting, you know, all the different pollen traps on the fronts of the hives and stuff. And mm-hmm. and then I had totally forgotten that the Apame hives have that pollen insert. And they're just sitting on the shelf. And I could just do that. So thank you, Cayman. You just saved me from a lot of work. And I'm going oh, yeah. to participate and uh, let people know that our corn is toxic and soy and everything else. So, all right. Because we put That's them on good. as soon as the corn tassels and we want to find out how much of that pollen is finding its way into the hives. And of course, what the toxins are, the potential toxin. And, and, I'm also and interested to see the, the, uh, the protein levels. That'd be interesting if they show that as well. Yeah, I don't know if they're they're testing for specific things. So I don't know if they'll give us a protein. It's very hard, by the way, to find out uh, the the protein profiles of all the different flowers and stuff because it even varies depending on the land that you're growing those plants on. So it's not even always locked into the species of plant. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting too. So what did you find to be the strongest uh, attribute of having an Apame hive? Was it the insulation or the fact that it was going to never need a finish and be durable for years? And You know, there's several merits there. Um, it's nice that the bees can stay cool and stay warm. Obviously, they're insulated, and that means your bees are, are less stressed out. And uh, one of the biggest problems we have in Tennessee and in, in the South is um, bees being more stressed later into the, the season, late July, August, and you're, they're dealing with heat. They could be dealing with high varroa loads as well. So I think that's great. But it's it's a lot of fun to to move them too. You know, since they latch together, mm-hmm. and if you have two people and each it's a double deep box, and you can grab two handles a piece, they're very easy to move. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's quite different from a traditional hive. But um, you know, I I think some people throw it into the, the knick knack odd area category and i i think if they tried it once they would understand that this is a very legit product mm-hmm. oh yeah i have to be honest i thought they looked like play school furniture you know when i first saw them uh and some of the ones i saw had black mold on the outside you know like when you see somebody's got a play school toy that sits in their yard for a couple of years and it all looks black and moldy that's yeah. kind of what i thought but then when i started really looking into it and, and another big part of that was meeting the I don't know if he if he's the owner or the chief engineer or the marketing. The the uh, tall guy, Korhan. Yeah, super friendly guy. Is he mm-hmm. the owner? Is he his dad, I think, started it. Is that right? His dad's so, an no, his dad's an entomologist and he's an engineer. Is that right? You know, they have too many titles to keep track of. It's, it's just, uh-huh. some some people just show off like that, you know. Um, Corhan's awesome, and his I've met his dad once, and he seems uh, really, really nice. I haven't got to sit yeah. down and have a conversation, but um, they run Apame here in the, in the U.S. The the main company is in Turkey, right? Um, but they run operations here, and I don't know all the exact titles, um, but I do know one thing I do like about Apame is that they they listen. 
to their customers. They, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. they, they, they have changed products several uh, adaptations of over the years, multiple times as people have given them feedback. And I think you can't ask for anything more than that in a company in beekeeping where mm-hmm. the company actually listens and and delivers. It's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. And the changes that they're making are really practical. They just did that new hive feeder that has mm-hmm. the reservoir in the center of it that you could put fondant or anything in there. Yeah, put and, a little bit uh, of fondant. I'll tell you uh, what, got... I was impressed. And the bees can go right up into it. That's Nobody else has that that I know of. I don't know if anybody's ever done that before. Um, I really like the the dividers that you can drop yep. in between them. Yeah, um, that's really handy. The pollen trap. If I had to pick one thing, uh, you know that, yeah, you know, I could have the hive, but I had to have one of the extra features. I really like the pollen trap. It can be really handy when that first surge of nectar's hitting, and you also at that time usually there's a ton of diverse pollens, and you just get this backfilling of both resources. And collecting pollen is a wonderful source of income for some beekeepers in Nashville where they're just charging like 30 bucks a pound. You can get a good strong hive to get half a pound a day, no problem during peak season. One day on, one day off, maybe keep your brood nest a little bit more clear for your queen. And Mm -hmm. I save ours back. So when we make those queen rearing colonies, we make our own pollen patties and using that pollen, just grind it up and mix it with some honey. And and that works really well. So the pollen trap is is real simple. And it's also got that screen bottom board and that IPM tray. So yep. I, I think that that bottom area of the hive is is quite handy. I like how it seals pretty good too. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask. So that's what you do with the pollen is you're cycling that back to your bees for queen brood production. Mm-hmm. Are you Absolutely. rearing queens, by the way? Do you do that uh, usually, too? usually we stop around this time of the year. Um, we okay. can still raise queens, but I'd really have tried to raise all of my queens in late March to about early July, and okay. th- it's just so much easier to get better queens, and it's just easier so we don't fight the season too much. We've been in a dearth of nectar and pollen since uh, mid June, and lack of rain. Know, now- or what's going on? Oh no, we've tons of rain. It's just things stop blooming usually around the second, the third week of June that honeybees can utilize in this area. So it's very green and lush here, but there's just not a lot of plants for honeybees after that period of time in this region of Tennessee. Now, if you go to other regions towards the mountains where it's, they're further behind their stuff, or if you go to the agricultural areas where they have cotton and soybean, mm-hmm. you'll get an extended flow. But no, there's there's very little pollens. There's just a trickle of pollen. And so the bee population is naturally going down. It's harder to raise queens. Not impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, the just percentages of queen queens coming back and just getting them accepted in the graphs. It's just, it's more difficult. And so we just get it done. I don't sell individual queens anymore either. So I don't have to push the season. Mm-hmm. So when you um, store the pollen and you're making these pollen patties and everything, uh, what time of year are you most likely to use them? So I'm going to be raising queens the end of March, April, May, June, okay. and and into early July. But I'll start collecting the pollen in late March. Okay. And you know, we obviously we watch the weather and we watch the bees. If you know the bees have had poor flying weather for the last seven days. We're not going to be trapping pollen. They haven't been able to get anything. Mm-hmm. But if we have the next seven to 10 days, it's going to be just perfect flying weather. Then, yeah, we'll trap every other day. And and that works really good. And we don't, I don't have a dehydrator. You know, some people can dry it and put it into jars. I've never done that. Mm-hmm. We just sift it and make sure that there's not, a, you know, a random bee wing or a small hive beetle that fell mm-hmm. down in there. Mm-hmm. And then we'll stick it in the freezer. And that I think that preserves it really well. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. How do you store it? Do you know what the impact is on the nutritional value if you run it through a dehydrator? I don't know. Um, I really have no idea. I I do know that pollen uh, does degrade Mm -hmm. semi-rapidly, especially Mm -hmm. if it's not in a freezer or dehydrated. But Mm -hmm. uh, even bee bread, if you take it and store it in the freezer, 
Mm -hmm. um, it, it degrades. So I don't know all the technical details, but fresher is better. And whenever we do our queen rearing, we'd always make sure there's a fresh bee bread frame right next to the grafts. And then we're going to feed that real pollen patty on top. And so we really overkill it, but that's how we get, you know, really big queen cells and nice queens. So making it yourself, you save a lot of money for sure. If people are watching this and wondering what pollen patty with real pollen in it that you would recommend as a nutritional source for them, do you have a favorite company or is it global patties or what do you think of the hive alive patties that have pollen in them? Mm -hmm. What uh, yeah. are your thoughts on any of that? The, the worst patty is the one not fed, um, in my okay. opinion. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of good patties out there that'll get the job done. And pollen patties are a tool. Um, calling them a substitute is is a flat out lie. I don't think there's anything nefarious behind that name, but they're a supplement. Uh, bees cannot live long term just off of these things. They supplement what's already in there and can help create full protein profiles. Let's say you have some pollen coming in. It's only got five of the like 10 essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. Well, you throw this pollen patty in there and maybe you've completed that. And mm -hmm. now your bees are able to produce more brood because of it. But just to feed this pollen patty by itself for months and months on end with no real pollen, your colonies are going to eventually collapse. Yeah, no, I agree. So yeah. Yeah, you know, and not only that, that's not a tenable way to keep your bees. I mean, if you had to do that for months on end, you'd kind of be out of business, I would think. Yeah, it's unless it's definitely... you know somebody that does that. Are we stepping on anybody's toes? Is there anybody that no. has a supplement? Like they live somewhere where bees couldn't exist at all. <laughs> they gotta take so they have to feed constantly out. just to barely keep them going. No, so you know, get to your question, favorite patties. You know, I've used a lot of brands over the years and and they all can be used. I think the first thing that I look at is is price point, especially from a business standpoint. Um, what can I get that's affordable and does a good job? And then if it one does a better job and it's just a little bit more expensive, um, then that's something to consider. I like the global patties. I've switched to those for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. They make a softer patty. So they don't transport as good in larger bulk, but they pack them in smaller boxes. So that's not a non-issue. Um, if you'll see a lot of the commercial um, Man Lake or Dayton patties, they'll have these huge loose stacks of like a ton of them on a pallet, mm -hmm. but they're a much harder patty and they work. Mm -hmm. But since they're, they're made tougher for transportation, it takes longer for the bees to consume them right. in my experience. And with small hive beetles, I need something that is consumed quickly. And we will also, um, we don't do this in February when we start feeding them or early March in poor weather, but we will cut them up into three or four pieces and create more surface area so the bees mm -hmm. can consume them quicker. But I really like the global patties. Um, you know, the Hive Alive patties is a global patty with their Hive Alive product. Mm -hmm. Um Global also offers, and so does the Bee Supply, the Global Patty with the Canadian rocket fuel in it. I'm a pretty big fan of of both of those options because uh, they're both based off of the Global Patty, and they just have an additive um, to hopefully give a bigger boost. Um, you know, there's several good options out there, but I think a lot of it depends on on your location and 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 just knowing how to use patties as a proper tool. One of the things that we've always had at our conference and is, um, is pollen patties at large, a small, uh, where the small guy could get the, the commercial prices, essentially, even our first event, um, we had that available just in smaller quantities. Mm -hmm. So if you had to look at something that you spent a lot of money on thinking it would supplement or benefit the bee production and it just didn't have a return on your investment, what do you think if you had to cut something that you wouldn't buy, uh, what would it be? Or has it all kind of worked out? What was something you thought was going to be fantastic and it just didn't pan out? And you said, that's the last year we tried that. Oh, gosh, you're going to get me in trouble, Fred. That's um, okay. We have to be honest here. Let's just let's yeah. just throw it out. Just Absolutely. So there's a lot of um, products out there that mm -hmm. 
you know, our additives and, and various things, and everyone's trying to, to do something that's helpful. The problem of it is, is I think a lot of the essential oils have gotten way blown out of proportion. Mm-hmm. Essential oils are really good at killing things and bacteria mm-hmm. and fungi are one of them. Mm-hmm. But the honeybee, just like our body, has healthy microflora that does not need to be damaged. So mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of these essential oils, I think if you've got healthy bees, why are you feeding them? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know you did a, a test, you know, a rudimentary test with different um, sugar syrup ratios with sure did. essential oils. And uh, the bees like the stuff that uh, didn't have anything in it. Correct. Um, yeah. And... frame on you um actually it was really instantaneous you're just gone just gone yeah that's me i'm out of here okay so we were talking about i have a live fun it so you've actually tried that or and then we're the essential we oils that don't deliver what they were supposed to and my backyard studies that show that the bees preferred sugar syrup with nothing in it which is true yeah, when we were talking about um, one of the products I've been using, and that's the the Hive Alive uh, with the thiamol ball. And, and for a couple of reasons, like if I make 300 gallons of syrup at a time yeah, and I don't use it all and I've got 50 gallons left, 40 gallons, whatever the number is, I can put that in there and that will keep it from fermenting on me until I'm ready to feed it later on that week. Oh, that does too. I know that Honey Bee Healthy and stuff extended it, but Hive Alive also extends it. Uh, yeah, it does. I don't so, even know how you lifted that. That was some pretty good deltoid work there, Cayman. Oh, yeah. Is that a full uh, one or is that like a quarter full and you're just pretending it's loaded? <laughs> it actually is full. I just got this in because we're running low and I like the, the thymol. And there's people that are yeah. responded on my live chats going, you know, why are we using this stuff? You know, beekeepers have just started using this recently. That's maybe that's why the bees are struggling. Well, there's information dating back like a hundred years ago where beekeepers were using thiamol to try to combat chalk brood and European fowl brood and, and different things. So um for me, it's more of a sugar um preservative mm-hmm. um between feedings and my tanks and also keep my lines all nice and clean. Mm-hmm. Um, but also it does have some a therapeutic. Uh, aspects to it as well so if i'm going to go with something in my feed i really like thymol because it has a lot of literature showing that there are um, positive reductions in um, some of the maladies that bees face Absolutely. And so yep. I, I really i really like that and then of course there's the research on the um the seaweed additives i haven't done a lot of homework on that side of it but i like the thymol aspect and i really like the smell <laughs> yeah, well, it's a pretty, there's no question what's in it when you put that in it. Cause I use that stuff too. And I'm with you on everything you just said. And it's one of the few supplements that has, you know, scientific studies backing it up. Right. So, no, I'm in their corner 100% on that stuff. And I don't even know if we understand the extent of some of the benefits of that in the hive. Um, because I've asked them a lot of questions that, are not proven, but are possible. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know if it may have some impact on like making it unpalatable or a hostile environment for Varroa mites, because I would like to segue into this year, you've been doing routine Varroa mite counts. Um, No, um, we typically don't do the routine Varroa mite counts until um, August. We do spot check. And Mm -hmm. so there was a, BR that we had that we didn't get around to doing the, our oxalic acid vapors yeah. uh, to in December. And so they were elevated and there were some several really good bees in there, but we were opening them up in mid March and there are strong doubles and I'm breaking apart the brood nest. And, you know, there you can see Varroa mites where the drones are in between the frames. Wow. And so they're, they're obviously quite strong, but I'm already seeing this many mites and it's March. I'm like, man, this is not where they need to be. And so uh, we did alcohol wash those colonies. And then, of course, we we're like, oh, gosh, gosh, if it's this high uh, this time of the year, we got to do something now. And so for the first time in 21 years, I did a hard spring treatment. Hmm. 
and, and you know what? I liked it. Uh, we used Formic Pro. Uh, I had been talking to uh, Tommy Nolan, um, Tom Nolan, but I like to call him Tommy, mm -hmm. um, about you know F Formic Pro and using that. And most beekeepers in my area just don't treat in March and April um, or May. And you know what? Best honey production yard that I had this year was the one that was with yeah with the mites, but we hit yeah. them with the uh, the full dose of formic, and the temperature was uh, right. Uh, the bees, um, you know, they took a little bit of a brood hit, you know, during that period. But honestly, it, it really retarded the swarming down because it was right when the bees were just gearing up to hit the strongest part of the swarm season. Mm -hmm. So really, when that normal trigger hit they were still just finally recovering from that brood hit and they were great uh, very so clean they, that might have actually also worked to reduce the propensity to swarm because you yeah. knock down the numbers a little bit and you do impact brood did you do the single single pack or did you do the double pack treatment did you I do did one the after another or did you do them two together if it was a strong production hive, they got the double. If it was a, a single that needed some work, it only got the single. And then I came back and gave them the single later. And okay. um, it worked out really good for me. Um, and obviously there was a hit, but then there was that they cleaned up and they produced really good. I made a lot of honey in that yard this year. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very curious to try that again next year because I've been talking to a beekeeper who actually uses formic to reduce their propensity to swarm mm -hmm. in spring yeah. and also as part of his varroa management so um really interesting concept i, I, I want to try it again next year yeah i could see immediately that that would be something that would work because i mean that's why they're swarming they're brooding up so fast and their population is getting so high same time the varroa mites are reproducing in that brood that sounds mm -hmm. like kind of a perfect resolution for that. If you know that they're mite loaded, um, and do you know what the efficacy was? It, what was your post treatment count like? You know, I didn't write this stuff down. If I'm honest, Fred, um, okay. I did. I did do washes afterwards, and I was yeah. like, "Wow, this gets me down below one percent." Okay. And the majority of them were below one percent. There was two in that yard of a little under forty colonies that I had to retreat. It wasn't that they were crazy high, but I wanted to get them all the way down. Right. And um, but I did that, and great looking colonies now. Um, so that's that's one of the problems with running you know, several hundred hives is it's mm -hmm. especially when it's just myself or or Laurel with me when she can. Um, to be able to fine tune a lot of this stuff. Most mm -hmm. of the, our alcohol washes again happen in August. So we're going to go through after we've treated here in, in ju early July and June, we're going to come back in August and then we'll wash every colony and see where we're at and see if we need to drop some more hurt. Mm -hmm. So for the colonies that gave you the challenge like that, what were the pre-treatment numbers? What kind of mite washes were you seeing? Uh, we were We were seeing numbers like eight in a wash we were seeing six in a wash you know we were seeing oh. some that were well i mean that's two percent and it's march you know i know but i, I mean there are people i talked to do you get inspected by the state yes yes we do they do. come through and do they count your mites no, they don't care about varroa they want to just make sure we don't have american foul brood primarily. okay because when we because i talk to them about mite counts and mite washes and stuff like that they kind of have a competition among themselves to see who gets the most and there'll be some with 20 or 30 mites in a wash not from me but i mean other apiaries they're inspecting and they're always you know groups that aren't that aren't counting so when these guys come through actually the mite washes are optional like when they come he says you want me mm -hmm. to wash for mites i said yeah every single hive i'll be drinking coffee while you do it yeah, my because tax dollars the, are paying for this. It so, does it yeah, for me. The whole yeah. service. <laughs> and then I get to know what's going on. He does a really good job and I can make a video about it. So it's a win, win, win for me. But uh, okay, so that's not terrible, but I'm glad to know that the Formic Pro is what you're using. Have you ever tried the Mighty Way Quick Strips or anything like that? You know, how did you, how um, did you land on Formic Pro as your treatment with Tymol? Uh, Formic, yeah, yeah. Um, so the the formic pro um i landed on it because i just i like the shelf life um, that's that's really the reason two years this, now with the current formula right 
Right. And the, that's the problem with the max or the minor way quick strips is that you get a one year shelf life. So half the time you get them and if, you know, the company has been sitting on them for five months and you got to use the things fairly quick. And so that's 100% of the reason I went with Formic Pro. Um, I know beekeepers who still prefer the max because they've learned how to use them. They're, they're slightly different. Um, but I really think Formic is maybe the most misunderstood treatment. I love the fact that, you know, Formic breaks down into very uh, natural compounds mm -hmm. and it's very, very clean. Uh, mm -hmm. The biggest problem that people have with Formic, especially the new beekeepers, is they use it and either they don't set up things properly or they'll put a full dose on a small hive or right. they don't realize it. But that queen's old. She's already kind of declining. And then you drop right. Formic. Well, yeah, it's going to trigger them to supersede that queen. Mm -hmm. So. A commercial beekeeper is going to look at it from a different standpoint. It's like, mm, this product is going to help me clean mites and identify which queens are not that great anyways. Okay. And so I think Formic has a, a good opportunity for the, the beekeeper who really wants to dial things in and keep things clean. Mm -hmm. And then the recovery rate to get them back full swing. What do you think the time frame is after treatment? Full well, group and everything. You know, if you use the thing properly and you have a good queen in there, it's not it's not bad at all. Not much of a hiccup um, for what you get out of it. It's totally worth it. I don't know the well, yeah. exact time, but like a brood cycle. Yeah. Um, and then what you get back are healthier bees without mites. So the recovery and productivity of those bees is much better than if you hadn't treated. So exactly. And you were I was seeing a yeah. couple of the hives in the yard that you could start seeing that the patterns were starting to suffer even in late March. And mm -hmm. one of the, th the telltale signs, and this is something that a beekeeper has a lot of frame time. will see over time is the cappings just don't look as uniform. This, they're not the same color. They're, they are not quite as oval and perfectly shaped mm -hmm. and the bees just are stressed out from these mites. And so when we dropped this formic, yeah, it slowed the brood production down. But when the bees popped back from that beautiful cappings, right. and the bees yep. looked didn't look listless anymore. Um, and I was able to use it with my honey supers on, which I, that time of the year I was throwing them on. So perfect. Yeah. And people that are listening should know that that's an organic treatment. So it's considered safe. So Dude. What? <laughs> oh, it's organic, man. Okay. Um, All right. Can I help this. it. I don't know what we're talking. I don't know what we're doing. I don't, I'm not from Tennessee, so just expect me to not understand a lot of the local lingo and stuff like that. Okay. We don't understand it. <laughs> so, um, so what's big and new this year as far as your bees go? What are you trying that's new, or what's your? Have you changed your hive configurations, or management, or venting, or entrance sizes, or? What modifications, mm -hmm. if any, have you made and why did you make them? Okay, so that's a great question. I actually have an answer for a change, so that's nice. Um, <laughs> one, one of the things that you know, we're doing, everything's business related for us, but I, I think that there's still so much gleaning that smaller beekeepers can get from uh, professional beekeepers trying to dial things in with their bees. So one of the problems that I have, just like anybody else, is good, strong bees want to swarm. Mm -hmm. And if my bees swarm, I don't get as big of a honey crop and I don't have as many bees to sell. So we're trying to find what's the perfect balance between getting a good size honey crop, but also not pulling the bees back enough to not let them swarm. And so one thing that we did this year is typically our, we, we pull them back harder. And typically what we'll see is our first surge of nectar is around the first week of April. And so that really triggers swarming and that's a natural stimuli that the bees get to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So we need to do something about that. And in the past, what I've done is just keep them super, super strong. And then like every five days go in there and I cut cells. Try doing that over a bunch of colonies and see with supers on and see how well your back likes you. Mm -hmm. um, even in, you know, my twenties, you know, after doing that for weeks, I would not be able to sleep hardly. Sometimes my back would hurt so much. And so we're trying to save my back and we're also trying to be smarter about things. So what we did this year is right prior to April, 
we cut all the colonies back that were for honey production down to four frames of brood. And I draw a lot of extra combs, um, even this time of the year. And those extra combs are stored back, and then I can use them to pop in during that time. So we'll take, it, there'll be double deeps going in right before the flow. And then we will drop them down to four really good frames of brood or five frames that will equal about four frames of brood. And then we can leave a frame of food or so. And then we're going to give them a couple drawn combs for the queen to lay. They keep all the foragers and then all of the other brood and, and a decent enough nurse bees to keep them warm is going to go over here. And I'm going to give them a little bit of either some reflectix that like that bubble insulation yeah. or double something. Bubble. Some, Exactly. Something to keep yep. them insulated or a double screen board or snail grove board would be perfect in this situation because that new split is going to lose all the forager bees and I want to keep them warm. But then that new split is going to get a queen that I purchased or a queen cell that I've raised, which is what we did this year. Mm -hmm. And so I do that on 100 hives. I'm going to get at least 75 of those splits to get a new queen and I'll make some extra nukes so that I can fill in the other 25. But what's exciting about it is that the original colony gets that little hiccup there, and then the stimuli for st swarming just, it's gone. And then they'll go into trying to build up mode to get where they want to be population-wise. And I've got these honey supers that I place above it at the same time all this happens. So we reduce them down to four, fill that up with other combs, excluder, so it's single brood management at this point, and then comb 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 box of comb box of foundation mm -hmm. and by the time the bees get strong again they have already committed so much to putting nectar into the honey supers we get very little swarming after that point as long as we don't let them run out of super space we mm -hmm. do lose the occasional swarm but it's it's very seldom and some people are like well you could have got more honey if you'd let those bees with them but to the contrary i can't manage and cut through all those cells running it the old-fashioned way now maybe i only average 80 to 100 pounds per hive mm -hmm. but um, i don't have to get in there every single week during the honey flow and cut cells out so it works really good for me and i had good success with that this year and those splits are all now two to three deep boxes strong that i made in late march and those those can be sold or used to fill in any gaps where we maybe lost a queen or something. So did you say that you're doing single brood management, single deep box for your brood? Yes, we've been doing that for the last, I don't know, five or six years. And yeah. it's a kind of like a race car. It's got to be finely tuned, finely tuned yeah. to work. But um, you get it right, and uh, it's a phenomenal way to do business. Mm -hmm. Well, and also narrows the amount of searching you're doing to find your queen when you're trying to verify everything, right? So is that part of your decision for doing that is to know where the queen and all the brood is located? Yeah, super efficient. There's the queen. Oh, if I'm looking for queen cells, they're all in that one box. If I'm looking for brood, it's all in that box. When I need to pull honey, I pull everything down to that single brood nest. And so that's why even in a poor year, I usually get 80 pounds off of a honey production colony. Mm -hmm. And in a great year, I can get up to 140 pounds off of a honey production colony like that. And then I yank all of that off. And now here's the extra benefit. And this again is for production mm -hmm. is I pull them off and it's very critical that they get fed immediately because when I pull those honey supers, I have about two and a half to three deeps worth of bees. Um, lots of bees. And what we're going to do is now put a box of foundation, pull up a frame of eggs or larvae, very young, and then we're going to feed them very heavily. They need to get a couple gallons immediately. And then we're going to come back five days later and give them a couple gallons again. And you have this massive adult bee population and they'll draw out that foundation within a week to 10 days, no problem. So you'll get a whole new box of foundation per hive. And if they have a good queen, a lot of times we can get them to draw two deep boxes. So we draw a lot of combs post flow. As soon as we pull those honey supers, foundations go on and we'll feed seven to 10 gallons over the next month. No problem of sugar syrup, but it's totally worth those new combs so we can sell more nukes next year. And, um, 
we get to pull the entire honey crop. And so that makes it to where we can produce more honey. So what is your favorite way to get the bees out of your honey zippers? For them to just do it themselves, but they never do that. So <laughs> uh, what you wanted, what would be ideal is to get to it right before the end of your honey flow. So there's no robbing going on okay. and you miss just a tiny bit of nectar, but that's okay. The bees can enjoy that. And so when that nectar's coming in still, you have a large portion of your forager force out. So that already eliminates 50% at least of trying to get them out. But then using a fume board and a bee blower, um, I, I use those in combination uh, because I don't what's use a, what's the a bee blower. It, it's just like a, a blower you blow leaves with. I, I use is a battery like powered. A, is it like a leaf blower or is it actually a bee blower? Are you using no, a leaf it, blower a leaf and just blower. you relabel it? You just put a different label on a leaf blower and call it a bee blower? Uh, so have you bee... not learned, Fred, that everything belongs to bees at this point? Uh, so it's a bee blower that happens what's to your, also be what's useful your favorite for one? leaves. What's your, is it, it's battery powered. What's your favorite one? So I use the, the DeWalt 60 volt model. Bob Benny uses the Makita and really likes it. I already had a lot of DeWalt stuff, so it just was natural to go to that. Yeah. Um, but I've been really satisfied with it. Um, is that the most could, powerful one they make? It's the most powerful one that DeWalt makes that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was at the time. Okay. Um, and since I also use that uh, vaporizer that's battery powered with DeWalt, it just kind of all right. works and really the vaporizer well. Vaporizer you're talking about is the instant vap. Right. Yeah. Me too. It's my favorite one. So give us a sense of scale. How many hives are you running? And uh, like, what's an example of, is this all on your property or do you have satellite ap apiaries out? What's going on? So we have uh, several bee yards and usually I'll run about 40 colonies to a bee yard. Um, my house ends up with more because it's just my house and it's easier to mm -hmm. throw 80 in here. But it just really depends on the time of the year. Sometimes of the year that we'll have um, as many as 500 colonies. You know, that could be nukes that we're selling. It could be even more than that, especially with many nukes. It could be six or 700 small colonies with big colonies. But this time of the year, we've geared down quite a bit. And, and also this year, we've geared down more heavily as well. So a city, I'm probably sitting on somewhere around maybe 150 production size colonies now. And also I've got a handful of nukes here and there, but I'm really considering just dropping down to a hundred hives and keeping it there, Fred. It, uh, I hate it. And I've really put it off for the last couple of years, but with all the other stuff that we do now, um, the bees really kind of cramp my style on those things. And those other things cramp my beekeeping lifestyle. So I don't want to have bees that I'm not taking care of properly. Like last year, I didn't get that oxalic acid vapor treatment done because of running the conference. I don't want, I don't want to do that again. Right. And that instant vap for somebody that's working as many hives as you are probably really accelerated your, your delivery of oxalic acid for the colonies that you were treating that way. I mean, just I love for that me, machine. you do the whole love thing it. in an afternoon for me, but for people that are commercial, I can see that as a huge advantage. Well, they do such a good job. And, you know, I remember when, you know, they weren't that popular and uh, Rob and I were talking about it and, and the guy that makes them, Janos Finosi, I think that's his yep. last name. Yep. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, I think, a really good uh, gift to the beekeeping industry. He's got a very brilliant mind and he's hardworking. And one of the things that I think I love the most is that um, some people don't have the drive for excellence. They want to get a product out there. They want to make some money. Mm -hmm. Some people have to have a top tier product that brings something very good to the beekeeper. And he walked me through the entire process of the inner workings of those machines and explained to a, a, a novice like myself why this type of wiring is important why this type of ground is important mm -hmm. and these things are way i think they stand quite a, a head and shoulders above anything else i've ever used and mm -hmm. i love that so anyone that does anything like that in the industry i want to see them succeed and i'm rooting for them 
Yep. You know what? I like that philosophy because uh, obviously I didn't need anything like that for my small backyard test aviary and stuff. But uh, the very things that you just described there uh, are why, you know, I spent the money and bought one, why I wanted to endorse him and talk about it. I, you know, I'm an engineering analyst. That's my background. But uh, yeah, for the, all the reasons that you just described, the quality and uh, his own testing and his own concern for the effectiveness of that unit. I just think... Mm -hmm. uh, People like that should be celebrated and supported. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're getting to the end here. Um, so a lot of people want to know, because they ask about conferences. So we want to talk about, you're going to run a conference this year and what will the dates be and where will it be? Whatever you can tell us. All right. So cutting edge information, Fred, cutting edge. I, I you know, slide some honey under the table, I whatever it takes, you know. Uh, now, all jokes aside, I'm really excited to to put on this conference. It's going to be fun, and it is going to be at the Louisville Expo Center. That's in Kentucky. For those of you who don't know, it's not Louisville. <laughs> you know, it might have been back when we, uh, you know, prior to 1776, but it's Louisville now, and it's going to be the first weekend in January. And we're really looking forward to the new opportunities of this new location because there's so many um, people that we've had to turn away in the past. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're just really excited to be able to focus on this ever growing and exciting market of beekeeping. And what makes all of this work is the uniqueness that people bring, you know, whether it's personalities, whether it is, um, new products like that vaporizer that was a new product um, in the past uh, we want people to uh, bring all kinds of new gadgets and honey and gizmos and swap honey and and just celebrate their beekeeping with people who will actually understand uh, what this crazy uh, hobby or sideline of bees is like right that's a really good answer and thank you for filling us in on that because people i know are waiting and wondering my next question is have you ever considered being a professional musician? Oh, yes. Um, I okay. really wanted to be a professional bluegrass musician back in my late teens and early 20s, and I actually attempted to do so, and I actually had an offer one time to be a, a semi-professional musician, and I tried it out just a little bit, and my first gig was in Asheville, North Carolina, and unfortunately, there was a lot of people passed out from alcohol and and pot and i i got my fill in the of you know what that scene was like maybe it's not always like that but that mm -hmm. was my first experience and i was not i also didn't like being gone from my family my wife had um our first child and mm -hmm. I, I started realizing how much the travel uh, would take a toll on that relationship mm -hmm. so decided really quick that that was not for me i love playing music uh, but nope it's bees 100 percent. Yeah. bees 100 percent. now well that's that's good and too bad too because anyone who's heard you perform i mean we're getting a top tier performance i'm no bluegrass expert but i definitely know intonation and music skill musical ability when it comes to instrumentation and stuff like that and you guys were nailing it and i couldn't well. believe that you're a beekeeper and that's an interesting backstory but had you started that out today with the current climate, you could have just had a YouTube channel, start playing your <laughs> music. A lot of people take off just through social media these days. So it is interesting that the kind of the timeliness of that probably had an impact on the track of your life. So how often do you like play and perform? I know you did a little performance uh, time in church growing up. Was it your father who's a minister? Yeah, my, my he hasn't been his whole life, and um, but he has for for many years. And mm -hmm. um, no, we actually the the type of church that we go to um never did musical instruments in church. Um, okay. I'm I really personally don't have a problem either way. I I think it's more about heart issues, but that's another subject. Um, as far as playing music though, we had some friends that we grew up with that were really into it, and we were homeschooled, so when we were out of school. We were either outside or we were doing something with, I have two brothers, Ethan and Hayden, mm -hmm. one's in the Air Force and and one is um, a computer genius and 
you know, and then there's me, I'm the beekeeper. So, <laughs> uh, wow, that really hurts. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is it the, um, the computer genius that was the one that played with you on stage? Um, he wasn't or, able to the air force uh, guy. Um, neither one of them were actually there. This, uh, this oh, last they weren't. event. Oh. no, no. Um, Ethan was at the conference, but it was so last minute. Um, we had, needed some help. And, uh, you know, I've got a great relationship with both of my brothers. I call them up like, Hey man, I'm in a bind and mm -hmm. they're there, you know, so okay. very fortunate like that. And, uh, but Ethan plays the guitar and he can also play the harmonica I actually do both at the same time. And he can play the electric guitar as well. And a few other things. Um, Hayden's really good at the banjo. Hayden, I think was probably had, was one that had the most raw talent. It was very frustrating. I could practice for two hours and, and, you know, like say gain five points, so to speak, and skill level. And Hayden would practice 30 minutes and gain eight points and just be like, man. Um, but, you know, he decided to go into the chair force and and give them all that talent. Yeah. And <laughs> you said it. I didn't. Uh, come on. You know, you wanted to, Fred. OK, um, well, I have a son in the chair. I mean, the Air Force, so I can't, you know, he's in cybersecurity. I can't uh, talk about him, but uh, that's why I'm not mentioning him now. But uh, is that why the is that why the feed cut out earlier? Is that what that what that, that I'm was? Sure there, we must have said something he didn't like. He's trying to keep bees. He's got a volunteer swarm that moved into his flow hive in his backyard. So oh, really? So your um your your son's into bees too? Only because of me. I use them. I use him and his neighbor. They live 15 minute drive north of me. If I collect a swarm of unknown origin, I keep them as my quarantine yard. So if I don't know if it's feisty or will kill the cats, I put it there first. Ah, uh, well, so if they decide they, they get really interested, you ought to bring them with you to uh, this year's event. Um, you know, that's one thing that is a little another sneak peek is, uh, you know, you're going to be there unless something crazy happens. And yeah. uh, we're thankful for you. Um, being there the last couple of years and, and then being a part of uh, this year's uh, unique conference because uh, a lot of people like you. I mean, it's amazing how much you can fool folks through YouTube. Yeah. But um, you're, yeah. you're a fan favorite, Fred. I'm, I'm, you know, you're drinking out of a, a Randy McCaffrey mug right there. And I'm just wondering, you know, where's, where's the Fred Dunn pottery mug? I just want to know when that's going to happen. I don't, I just can't self-promote. I just, I'm too modest. I'm painfully modest, so I can't yeah. do that. But well, you know, I do I, have I, some way to be pottery mugs. They're just not ready for prime time. I'm just not ready for prime time. Well, yeah. you could put on there, um, you know, proud of my humility. That'd be a nice little. Yes, uh, that. that's a great contradiction. Absolutely. So, okay. Enough about me. Now, listen, um, and I will be there, by the way. If you put on a conference, wherever it is, I will be there. All you have to do is ask. Um, so the other thing is, uh, tell us one thing about yourself that uh, most people would be surprised about and don't know about. Ooh. I'm a fairly open book on my live chats, Fred. Um, yeah, I just I, need something that you've never said before to anyone else, and this needs to be the reveal right here. Just, just dig deep. <laughs> dig deep. Okay, so uh, I really like um, classic rock. Um, I, I like old music. I like old stuff. Um, I'm a mus I'm a music um, is my thing. I, I'm emotionally, if if something's gonna get to me, it's gonna be music. And anything from uh, the crooners um, to light rock to smooth jazz, I like all that stuff. Classical music, I grew up to listening to classical every night. I'm a huge music fan. I, rap is the only one that I, and, and improv jazz, I just can't seem to get into. Um, good country music. Shout out to my buddy Gus Mitchell. Um, you know, the stuff in the early 90s and prior. We'll sit and extract honey together and listen to that classic country music. So I'm a I'm a big music fan. Huge. So classic rock, name a song. One that you would crank the stereo up and and dance like nobody's watching. You know, summer of '69. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really? I'm not much really? of a dancer though. Okay. Uh, yeah, that one. I love the Eagles. Um, 
gosh, I, it's hard to, you know, Toto, um, Peter Cetera, um, Chica- well, Chicago. Um, wow, you are going into the past there. Yeah. So I, how, I was, what was your first exposure? Like, how old were you when it first hit you? Wow, I like that stuff. We could well, hear, hear it on the radio in the car. Where did you hear it first? Yeah, my dad um, was was one of those types, and I mean, th- this this is just a dad move, classic dad move. I mean, it's my car. You're going to listen to whatever I want to listen to, and so we didn't listen to kid music. We listened to you know, I was born in '88, so I grew up listening to the the replayed uh, '80s and sev- late '70s music that he grew up with, and then of course. Um, I learned to to like that. I my dad had a lot of cassettes. I actually collect, had a lot of cassettes early on, and I still have them. And my my two thousand three Prius that I drive, um, it was a great deal. Um, <laughs> it has a cassette player in it, Fred, and I almost I, threw those I, things away. I believe you. I, yeah, I got and you. Just, so I'll throw those cassettes in there, and I'll be rocking it like it's nineteen ninety three. Okay, so we're gonna go out and look in your car dash right now. What cassette is in the player? Um, Stephen Curtis Chapman, I'm pretty sure. Um, so that's a Christian pop singer. Um, okay, but he also mixes a lot of country and other instruments. One of my favorite Christian singers because he's a really good musician, and a, a lot of a lot of people these days just they're singers but they can't get the music. And that's what I loved about the classic rock era is, man, you had great music and then you had great singers as well. Mm-hmm. So that's a commentary on today's pop culture, I guess. That they're not- we have culture today? Okay, that did it. All right. <laughs> you know, bacteria is bacteria's culture. So, I mean. I Yeah. Okay. Bacteria's culture. All right. Well, Cayman. Listen, I want to thank you for coming on and doing this interview with me. And I really do appreciate, uh, I've been following you since probably your first videos were out. So uh, yeah, I'm just glad you're here. I think you put out a lot of good stuff. And I hope that uh, everybody listening, uh, whether they're in this country or not, might find their way to one of your conferences because it is going to be interesting and it's a fellowship like no other. So thank Mm -hmm. you for that too. And Say hello to Laurel from all of us, and thanks for being here. Thanks, Fred. See you later. Okay. So that wraps up another interview with Cayman Reynolds. I hope you found some good information that you can apply to your own beekeeping practices. This series is also available as a podcast under The Way to Be. If you find videos like this to be helpful, please consider subscribing to my channel. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this has been The Way to Be. Until next time, I wish you all the best in beekeeping. Hi, and thanks for having me on, Fred. So, like you said, I'm, am I supposed to say, dang, dang it, Cayman Reynolds? You have to introduce yourself as if somebody hasn't met you. So okay. Okay. I, this, I is gonna, this is, this is going to shock your system. Some of my viewers may not know who you are. <laughs> so, this is okay. We're introducing you to at least five new people. All right. So, so hi, I'm Cayman Reynolds. I live in Tennessee. I, you know, keep an apiary in my own backyard. I travel the world informing people regarding how they should keep their bees and pointing out where they're wrong and why. You know, I mean, you could, however you. Why don't you do it? That was great. No, I'm going to do my, uh, I'm already going to introduce you, but listen, this is, you still have to say who you are, where you are. All right. right. I'm ready. This, I got it this time. You're ready. Okay. Go.